Okay, well, um, it uh, falls to me the honor of uh, both thanking and welcoming. And um, for those of you who don't, meet, don't, meet, don't know me, I'm, the, uh, I'm Michael Diamond. I'm the academic director of the Integrated and Marketing and Communications Department here at the NYU School of Professional Studies uh, and a professor in the Division of Programs of Business. And it's absolutely my uh, honor to uh, thank George Ben Arroyo, one of our fabulous faculty, for organizing this event and of course to give a hearty welcome to Umit and uh, thank him for sharing his time and his wisdom with our students and uh, it wouldn't be appropriate either to leave out our wonderful um, IMA uh, student organization led by Ria and her colleagues uh, for supporting all of this so to George's class Umit, Ria and her colleagues uh, I'm sure we're going to have a fabulous evening and, and many thanks for, for setting us off. Super. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael. My name is George Benaroya, and uh, during the day, I work as a CFO. I started my career at Procter & Gamble, then Tetra Pak, Beiersdorf, and now in private equity. Now, once per week, I get to do something I love, and that is to teach this finance class. And let me show you how we do it. So on the first session, students get to pick a company, any company they like. And then we look at how companies use finance to make business decisions. So on session two, we look into headcount. How many people are we going to hire next year? And what is the reason why we're going to hire so many people? Now, in Europe, by law, there are certain regulations about severance. So when we have to think about where we will need to lay off some colleagues, we look into what can we learn from other countries. The next session is about pricing. How will we increase prices around the world next year? And we look into things like what will be the impact of delaying a price increase from January to March? Or in New York, salaries are 56% higher than in El Paso, Texas. So we ask ourselves, should we have a local, national, or global price list? And the idea is that students share different opinions, as you have seen on the slides, and we foster that in class, which is what we do um, at global companies. The other thing that we do is to invite senior executives to share with us how they make these decisions in real life. Tonight with us, we have Umit Subashi. As former president of Campbell International, he managed all global businesses outside the Americas. Prior to that, as member of executive board and president emerging markets at Biosdorf, he led a significant expansion in delivering consistent growth across all geographies. He started his career at uh, S. Johnson, and he led markets like Germany, Russia, Bulgaria, Romania, Turkey, and Italy. Now, let me take a minute to share something more personal, which in my opinion is relevant. The first day I met Mr. Subashi, I went back to the hotel thinking, how can be so smart and ask so many good questions? and be so humble. For those of us who work with him, we remember that he always kept his door wide open. Now, these German companies are not open door Google. People treat each other by Mr. Mr. Subashi, Mr. Benaroya. You need a key to be able to get to the top floor if not the elevator won't stop. And there are 20,000 employees. So if you forget the key, then it will be an issue with security. Now, in these companies, you typically have five or six levels. So it's intern and then supervisor, manager, director, vice president, and then CEO or board member. And to get an appointment with a board member, you go through the system and you get it typically six weeks later. Not with Mr. Subashi. You will see our colleagues from marketing just going to his office and asking for help. And he will help them out right there on the spot. Once uh, I was going to the airport and he offered a ride. 
And that day was his last day at uh, this German cult band. He, he was accepting an offer to later become the president of Campbell International. And I remember that when he got out of the car, the Mercedes, he started to thank his driver. And this was like in the movies, you know, when the president or the prime minister is leaving office and they find the driver. But Subashi was different. He did it in a way that you could see this very tall German guy, the driver. And as he was thanking him for his service, the driver had tears on his eyes. I'm very pleased to welcome as our last speaker for the night session to speak about the value of feedback, Umid Subashi. Thank you, George. Very kind and very polite as usual. Uh, a bit of drama in there, exaggerating certain parts probably, uh, but I appreciate it. Uh, always very sincere and authentic. Thank you for that. Uh, good, good morning, good evening, good night, uh, wherever you are across the world. Uh, I, I love that aspect of this type of encounters as we did. Um, with George in our professional lives when we work together, um, overseeing a huge number of markets all, all around the place. And uh, it was a 24 seven job. And uh, you couldn't simply assume it's the same time anywhere else in the world, which uh, unfortunately some companies still do today. Uh, I won't give any names, but <laughs> I've seen a few and they think it's the same time zone anywhere else in the world when they give you a call or send you an email and expect a, a quick answer. So I'm based in Sydney, Australia. It's about noon here. A beautiful day outside and we're getting into summer. Um, and uh, I'd like to greet you all uh, from here. It's absolute pleasure to be here uh, with you all. Uh, and, you know, whenever we talk to each other during this session, my name is Umit and not anything else. Please do not make the mistake of addressing me as Mr. Subashi or anything else of that nature. You will seriously offend me if you do. So please keep that in mind. Um, Again, special thanks to George, also to Michael uh, for having me here. Uh, I think it's a privilege to, um, to, to join a workshop like this because it's always a learning opportunity also for myself. Uh, you just get to have this exposure to many different perspectives on any given topic. And that is, you know, uh, a bit the basis of collaboration and a tremendous enrichment uh, in in what we do in our lives. Um, and obviously you have to be open for it. Uh, eventually people later in their lives, they, they close their lenses and certain doors to, to learning from others. But uh, I think most of you are, are early in your careers and in your life. So uh, I hope you can appreciate this opportunity. Uh, I think it's great. Um, by no means do I claim to be an expert on the topic. I wanna be clear upfront. So, We'll be just talking on some real life experiences. Um, and, and I'm also aware that there is a great level of willingness to ask questions and have a dialogue. And I love that, um, uh, that opportunity. So I'll, I'll try to keep my, uh, my talking uh, concise and, and as, as brief as possible. So we can, we can entertain questions and different thoughts um, to encourage shared learning in this group. Um, and, and as I'm no expert, uh, I won't be talking to you necessarily about uh, achievements or successes. Hopefully we'll get to speak about failures. Um, and I'm personally, um, really willing to do that. And I think it's, it's an attitude you have to keep throughout your life to be open to failures, because as they said, the fa you know, failure is shortcut to success and, and learning from failure which is the essence of a feedback process, is something that brings us potentially success. So that's the perspective I'm having. So let's talk and have some fun. Um, and let's say, make the most out of Q&A. Uh, for some lighthearted humor, I put even some pictures of Yoda on the background. Uh, so hopefully it makes you smile. There is nothing, nothing serious uh, back there in terms of imparting any wisdom. No, it's about failures and experiences. Uh, I'd like to share my screen now, uh, if you just give me a sec. Um, uh, 
And um, I'll start by quickly taking you through of what type of uh, segments I like to cover. Um, and by no means is this a one way communication. So happy to have questions as we walk through these topics um, and, and establish a dialogue. Uh, I'll try to talk around the value of feedback, the process of feedback, uh, the character needed to, to handle feedback, um, and then also what to do with it, um, and, and how we uh, accept feedback uh, towards our, our firm convictions sometimes, and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the degree of change needed coming off a feedback process. And then hopefully we'll have lots of bonus material and, and Q&A as a part of the dialogue. But let's start with, you know, what is feedback exactly um, and, and what it means. And I want to put this into context before getting into any firm definitions in its most simple form. The context is that feedback is something that enables continuous improvement. It's a communication process, yes, but the goal of feedback is really enabling continuous improvement. Now, continuous improvement for teams, companies, organizations, institutions is one of the most difficult aspects of business management. One might say, oh, running your finances and numbers is challenging. Oh, having the right people is the most important thing in the business. Oh no, we have to be obsessed with our customers because our customers are uh, all valid. No question on that. But making a feedback process stick in an organization and especially in a scale organization, because in smaller ones, you can just talk to each other. If you're a business of or a team of 10 people, geez, just talk to each other. You know what I mean? Like that's, that shouldn't be too, too difficult. But if you have thousands of thousands, Institutionalizing the feedback process and the learnings that come out of a feedback process is one of the most challenging tasks for any leadership team uh, in, these, in these enterprises. And having it embedded because it's not a one-time event. It, it, it has to be going in perpetuity to make, to make sense of it. And I'll give an example on this, hopefully to land the point, how difficult it is to make that happen. So back to where I started, as I said, it's a fundamental communication process, but it's not one way, it's a two-way process. Um, and in most cases, it, it involves multiple parties around a given topic. But think about us as human beings. When we meet somebody, we say, we don't start with saying, oh, I love that person. Looks very trustable, I'll buy a car from that person. No, our default is cynical, sarcastic. We don't start with trust, our, you know, the, and I'm generalizing this, right? This is nothing personal about anybody in this group, but the default setting of a human being is like, what does that person want from me? That's really sort of the first thing that goes through our head. Now, that's not necessarily helpful uh, for establishing a feedback process and continuing it in, in, a, in a given setting. Um, and that is what makes it so difficult, even in established teams because there has to be the right culture behind it to make that happen. I'll, I'll speak more about that. Um, the minimum to make feedback successful is protocol and ideally trust. High performance teams operate in a high trust environment. That is one of the most outstanding attributes of a high performance teams. And they make most out of feedback as well. Look to any high performing teams that you, know, you can think of you will see among many, many other things that there is a basis of trust and there are certain protocols or rituals that make these things happen. And finally, it has to lead to action. So there is a task or an event that happens that is getting analyzed, out of which we ideally learn, but there has to be the action. So the blue piece on this pie chart here it is, from my perspective, the most difficult to address, as I was saying, in terms of institutionalizing and embedding that process, especially in scale organizations. Um, and, uh, and I wanna give an example um, from um, 
an emergency services uh, organization where I uh, work uh, in a voluntary role. Um, I'm also a voluntary firefighter with the rural fire service here in New South Wales, Australia. Uh, I've been doing this for the last six years. Um, and uh, I have all sorts of qualifications you can imagine for a firefighter. I take pride in that. And, um, and I learn a lot on that role in terms of real time, real life situations and things that I can take back to my personal life, but also to professional life. Now, one of the things we do, and, and this is something that will come up in one of the next pages, is something called after action review. It's a debriefing process. And I will break that down in terms of how that looks like, you know, in a few minutes. But the headline I want to leave you with right now is after every incident uh, response, there is a debrief process. And that applies to any broader activities within the organization. I hear very often the high ranking officers within the, within the, within the fire service that most of the outcomes of these after action reviews are not systematically reflected to better outcomes over time. Now that is kind of sad, especially for an organization that, lead, that in certain cases is dealing with life and death situations uh, because there is so many valuable learnings made day in and day out. And those that impact the broader organization, its well-being, its success, its health, uh, and, and that's kind of sad because I think we need to be better than that of, you know, addressing these the action parts. So debriefings might happen and that's even that is the difficult part to get to. Uh, and I will break it down in a minute. But after that, action has to happen coming out of debriefing and has to be closed off. And this is really the most difficult part. Um, in terms of you know its value, I can probably call out you know having different perspectives, uh, insights, and the 360 view around the things we do. It might be a, it might be a small team, a bigger team, uh, you know, a business, uh, a not for profit organization, an emergency service, whatever that formation is. Uh, once an action happens and learnings are being assessed and evaluated you get the different perspectives and the different viewpoints uh, for ideally to, to, to facilitate the continuous improvement that I mentioned at the beginning and get to that 360 view of how things can work better in the future. That is really um, the fundamental value of feedback, which is easier, you know, it's easier said than done, but capturing that value is probably the biggest challenge for uh, many organizations. Um, before I go to my next page and talk about the process of feedback, let me stop here maybe on the first couple of points I made and, and just check in if there is any immediate questions. We, we, we do have a question that has come through LinkedIn and, and Facebook. Um, it's complex, right? So the situation that we have now in, in many countries is that, for example, students are applying for, you know, PhDs or, or jobs and they don't get it or, or some people apply for jobs and they don't get it. And um, they would like to know, uh, you know, if we said better better process that could be used. Uh, I'll tell you how they have summarized it, the question and you can talk about it now or, or then on the next slide. The question goes like this. For those who applied for a job and had several interviews online, and for those who traveled around the nation for the final round of interviews and didn't get a job, what feedback would be appropriate? Yeah, I think um, uh, if, if, I, if I put this question as a layer on top of what I said until now, uh, without considering all the rest that is to come, let's think about it that way. You know, we looked at that circle in terms of, you know, something happening, uh, you know, learnings and actions. Essentially, what is missing in that picture that you described is the action. Something has happened, no assessment has taken place, and certainly no action has taken place. 
Now, I wish, you know, we, and I don't have that visual on my screen here, we could have a show of hands. And I wanted to ask the group, like who, who wants to work for a good company, uh, a company they respect, the, the culture that they respect or the purpose they respect in line with their own expectations. If we I do ask a gallery question, view, sorry, sorry um, could we do a gallery view uh, maybe, Natalie, so? We can look at that. Yeah, there we go. So now we can raise our hands. I chat. mean, if people can raise their hands, uh, yeah. I, I like <laughs> to think that many people want to work yeah. for a company yeah. where they have a shared purpose and, and, and is in line with their values, a, a culture they aspire to, and so on. Now, it depends always from where we look at. Um, but, you know, as, as Alice in Wonderland says, what you see is what you look at. It, it really depends on your perspective. Um, I think the question embeds the frustration of not having received the feedback. But if we change that window, that perspective for a second, yep, it, I have not received feedback. These and these pieces were missing. Is that really the type of company I want to work for? Because the truth is many companies today are just you know, purely arrogant. Uh, if we all sort of agree that the most important capability of a business uh, are its people, because people make a business what it is. That is really the essence of any business. The business model, the value chain, you know, numbers, everything else follows because it's the people that make it happen. So the culture that holds these people together and, and what you establish there is the most important aspect. And a business that doesn't respect its people in terms of giving a simple feedback saying, hey, we'll talk to you, we appreciate your time, but you know what? We don't think it's a good fit. Have a good day and best of luck. Now, the person who, who gets frustrated will probably appreciate that. You may not like the feedback, but you wouldn't have that frustration. A company that doesn't make that effort is most likely not the place you raise your hand for that you want to work for. So if I change the perspective, I say, well, that's a good thing because out of the 50 applications I made, I know that 48 of those are not worth to work for. That's how I look at it. I hope that makes sense um, because the one that matter will always come back to you in a way. Um, and if, if, if that equation doesn't exist at the beginning of finding the right place, the right culture, you know, it, it, it's eventually going to fail. So I think actually that's, that's not a bad thing. That's how I look at it. So let me just continue with the process of feedback. And there are different versions of this, right? There is no black and white on these in terms of what, how the process of feedback looks like in, in, the, in its most simple terms, that circle that I started with, and there are variations of these, but I want to keep this as simple as possible. I will give you some examples from uh, emergency services um, and, uh, uh, and just within the context of explaining what's the protocol of communication and, um, and where feedback comes into that picture. So let me just uh, show two examples. One of an, an emergency services or military organizations, whatever, they like to work with lots of acronyms. It's always the case. So this one is SMACS, uh, as it's called, not an easy one to remember, but it's essentially the, the, the first letters of situation, mission, execution, admin, command, and safety. Uh, the way this works is when we, when you pull up for, a, for, a, uh, for an incident or for a task, uh, the crew leader typically describes what are we dealing with? What are the operational details? Or well, we have a motor vehicle accident with one person trapped. There is a couple of casualties. We have to manage the traffic and take the situation under control. So I just flow, flew through situation and mission really quickly in terms of an actual example. Uh, we have to put out the fire, the car fire, and extract the casualties to safety. The way we will do this is, you know, by managing the traffic, maintaining safety at all times, um, and make sure the casualty is, is maintained in the, in, the, in the best possible position until ambulance arrives. Uh, and we will follow these timings, these and that, and describing the execution. Uh, we have no assistance. Uh, Ambulance is on the way. Um, there is no other support available right now, so let's focus on the task. 
uh, I'm in control right now. I maintain communications with Firecom and let's, let's keep an eye on the traffic hazards and on our safety because there is oncoming traffic from both directions. Uh, let's be extremely careful. So that would be a typical crew briefing when you pull, pull up to an incident. It's really quick and fast, but it follows a structure. So there is protocol, as I was saying. Now, once this happens, a feedback process comes into play. But as I give this example, let me give you another one, which is uh, a methodology that fighter pilots uh, are using. And this is an extract I have taken uh, from a really good friend of mine who has been fighter pilot for many, many years. And he's talking to companies about execution now. Uh, it's a business called Afterburner, which you may have heard of in the US. They are very successful as well. Um, and, and for them, it's all about what's the plan, what's the brief, how are we going to execute it, and how are we, are we going to debrief on this? Very similar if you can connect the dots with both sides. What are we dealing with? What are the details? What's our objective? Do we have any contingency? How are we achieving our goals? And they're all through it. Now, on the right-hand side, you see there is the debrief piece, which you don't see on the, on the red boxes. On the red boxes, there is something which we call AAR, which is after action review. And the questions are very similar. So once the incident is behind us, the way we provide feedback within the group, and ideally this happens nameless and rankless because it's not about individuals, it's about the common task at hand where everybody plays a role. So the first question is, what did we set out to do? I.e., what was the task? So everybody gets on the same page. Oh, we, we went out to kill the enemy. Uh, what actually happened? Oh, the enemy killed us. Um, I shouldn't be speaking right now because I'm dead. Uh, <laughs> um, so what went okay and what went wrong? And consequently, what can we do differently next time? So you see there is protocol and structure and it happens in a, in a sort of high performance environment, obviously, given the, uh, the situation of these, of these service organizations and, and the tasks they are dealing with. And this is being systematically captured in a, in a really quick conversation saying, we set, we set out to do this. This is what actually happened. I think we did this and this really well. We could have done this thing maybe better next time. And let's take this forward uh, as a learning um, and, and improve execution next time. So these are some examples uh, coming from that, from that area. Um, this is how communication happens and where feedback comes into play. Now, mind you, I don't want anybody to think, oh yeah, but that's emergency services. Business world is different, so it's hard to make this happen. Big capital letters, absolutely not. In bold and underlined, especially the one on the right-hand side. And I say this based on experience. I have brought in those fighter pilots to businesses I manage. They have instructed several teams across several layers around the PBED structure, plan, brief, execute, debrief. I cannot tell you how much execution uh, got upgraded within the business because you can apply to any project, uh, any work that teams in businesses are, are doing as well. The, you, the, the most common thing in companies is that you lack clarity in terms of what's happening, who is doing what. Why are you doing this? What's our common goal? People don't speak about these things. But once there is clarity, there is structure, and there is a way of communicating, then things move forward as simple as it sounds. Typically, business is simple. We just make it too complicated. And this is the type of you know, structures that can help us to deal with it, uh, even in the business world and in many other settings in life, quite honestly. Um, and provided there is this protocol and there is the trust, I think we can take a lot forward uh, from the feedback process. But quickly connecting the dots to what I said at the beginning, making the actions happen after the debriefing is the most critical process. And I'll give you an example. You know, today uh, I have a non-executive portfolio after the few things that George mentioned that I did in the past. So I advise some businesses um, in different business challenges. And there's there a couple of big clients where I work together with 
with the afterburner business, those, those ex fighter pilots, on the processes to make the debriefing actions happen and providing technology to follow these actions in a really simple way. That is such a big gap in well-known big businesses that struggle with execution and reflecting debriefing and the results of a feedback process into their, into their continuous actions. Because the goal is continuous improvement, right? This is so much happening in organizations. There's so much learnings. You want to take that along. Uh, it's priceless. Um, uh, and other examples, before I stop talking, maybe again for some questions is, um, people appreciate communication um, and being told what happens around them. Sometimes it's not just a task or a, you know, a, a clean cut small task or a project. Sometimes there are wider things happening, but you still need to debrief. An example I can think of is you know, about a year ago um, uh, when I left my previous role, which was a result of a sale process of Campbell International which has been sold to private equity following a 14, 15 month long process um, for the year before. And, and that's a long time for a business being up for sale. You are talking for multiple international locations, thousands of people, and they are just wondering day by day, what's going on? We are being sold. What's happening? What's next for us? Can we still keep our jobs? Can I still bring, you know, put bread on the table? Simple questions but you have manufacturing locations and, and people worrying about their lives. Uh, and because I consider the, my duty of care above anything else uh, as the leader of the businesses that I'm leading, on, on several milestones and in a frequent cycle, um, sort of every 45, 60 days, we would maintain open communication channels with the entire population of several thousand people. Open town halls, non-scripted town halls and Q&A sessions, uh, because these are highly political and high tension environments where critical questions come, come in, there is unions involved, you have to be careful in what you say. So there's, there's lot, there, it's a big minefield from my perspective to deal with this, but you know what? I value what people think and, and, and their concerns. So I have to be there to answer their questions. And on occasions, you know, we have visited 20 plus locations uh, or probably close to 30 communication moments in every single wave, covering every location, every shift, and talking to groups in terms of telling them what was happening. Hey, our business is up for sale, describing the situation. This is what's happening. This is how we're executing it. These are the current outcomes. This is what we learned so far. And this is what's gonna happen next. So kind of debriefing. It doesn't have to be you know, blocks. You can build it into your conversation and have the same outcome. And uh, as you can guess, they appreciate it a big time. Um, because if you know, the highest office in the business goes in front of the people and talks to them in an open way, in an authentic way, uh, that's usually valued. You cannot make everybody happy 100%, that's okay, that comes with the job. There will be always some cynical and critical people. But hey, if I keep 95% happy, I've done a good job. Um, so that's how I look at it. Any questions so far? We we have some personal questions, but they'll be more related to like the character and what to do with feedback. So if you yeah, want, yeah, absolutely. I have many many. <laughs> yeah, so let me roll on quickly then, and we can take questions. Let me talk a bit about the the character needed here. As I said, the most important thing is protocol and trust. But in, as persons being involved in this process, I think you need also a great level of self awareness. Um, it's easier said than done. It's one of the most fundamental leadership skills to be situationally aware at any given time in terms of what's going around you. That's a highly difficult task. You know, it's extremely difficult. Self-awareness and situational awareness because it's also dynamic. It just moves. The, the goalpost moves you know, on and on. So um, you have to stay on your toes. Uh, on your toes. Uh, which comes with certain level of confidence and assertiveness as well. 
within the right culture. Um, and as you will notice, I, I keep referring to culture again and again, because a culture which is based on trust that works on certain rituals is the type of character needed for the organizations, but also the character needed for the individuals that deal with feedback um, in, in an open way. Not as I described at the beginning saying our default setting is, is human being is, is just one of mistrust, uh, actually. Uh, no, this has to be on the other side. And, and clearly, um, some level of assertiveness is, uh, is, is important as well. Not you know, arrogance, but something that leads out of the self-awareness and, and, the, and the confidence in terms of knowing who you are, knowing what values you stand for, and knowing what's important to you and being able to make the decisions. I think this is, this is, um, this is really important as well. Um, and, and, and this sort of ties into what to do with this. Uh, you know, ideally, uh, there is the learnings captured, which lead to a certain action because there will be some gaps coming out of that learnings and those gaps need to be closed in its most simple form. And you might be thinking, hey, this sounds too simple. Uh, feedback is a com complicated thing. I don't get it. No, it's not like that. It's actually very simple. And hopefully I, I can convey that message uh, with these frameworks that I'm articulating here. Um, but it's always a balancing act because um, uh, it, <laughs> Those people, especially higher up in the food chain in, in, in companies, they will have high level of conviction and must not necessarily be open for change. Those are the closed door people that George referred to in certain company cultures. You enter a long corridor, all doors are closed. That's where the management works. You need a corridor with open doors and the, the willingness to entertain different perspectives because the biggest threats for us as individuals and for organizations in and with their leadership team is to think that you know it all. That is the biggest trap you can ever walk into. I know it all. I've seen it all. It doesn't work that way. That conviction is a conviction for failure. That's why the feedback process is so important to get the different perspectives, the 360 view, the learnings coming out of certain processes, projects, and so on and actioning on it so continuous improvement can happen in an organization. Um, Wait, but hey, is, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe one for I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, it takes us down as well because, uh, you know, there is the emotions. If, if protocol and trust doesn't exist, it ends to be an emotional setting. And those are the most tricky ones. Uh, when you enter in, in, on, on emotional, when you end up on emotional ground. Uh, and at that moment, that self-awareness, confidence, knowing what happened and what needs to be improved, that knowledge is really, really important. Um, because, you know what, people can be mean, really mean. They can knock you down and, and just make you feel bad. But uh, before you diagnose yourself with depression and, and low self-esteem, you know, I think you have to make sure that, in fact, you're not surrounded by poop bags. Because as a matter of fact, there is no reason to suffer the opinion of idiots. You know, but you have to know that line. And that is the, you know, the, the, uh, the balanced self-knowledge and confidence you need to pull those lines in terms of what goes into learnings and actions and what stays out of it. Um, those are sort of the you know high level points I wanted to make just to get us going, George. Um, Goody, so look, the the students have questions they will ask directly, but this one is from Katie, and uh, she asked me to ask the question on on her behalf. It's from Katie Jian, and she says, "What was the most powerful feedback you have you have gotten in your professional career, and how did it impact your life?" Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, unfortunately, I cannot give you a life-changing answer on that one um, because I don't think I had the luxury 
all, if I look back on my professional life where I had that Yoda figure who sits on top of my pictures, hey, telling me every single time what to do or, or imparting some wisdom on me. Um, although I think I found myself in a better setting as opposed to having somebody giving me highly valuable feedback, I, I was more in a setting where I had to look around me and in certain cases, look up to certain people to learn from them. So I had the privilege of working with really impactful leaders who did lots of good things in the businesses they led, yeah, professionally, obviously, um, and, and in terms of delivery of the business results, the cultural impact they had on the business. I, I was really lucky and, and privileged to be in a setting like that, but I had to look around and learn myself. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing uh, because that, that creates a self-reflective cycle and self-reflection is good for leadership, for improving leadership and developing your leadership because it leads to that self-awareness that I was talking about a few minutes ago. Self-reflection is, is absolutely important. Uh, and you will see that most of the good leaders are actually introvert. They, they will not be extrovert people. You know, the, the most charismatic ones could do the good conversation and whatever, keep people happy. That's all nice and beautiful, but that's not usually where leadership happens. Leadership happens behind closed doors and you need reflection for that. So I was more in a, in a situation where I, I had the, the privilege of having a few people like this around me, looking up to them and learning from them uh, in terms of the right behaviors. Caroline, would you like to go ahead with your question? Yes, um, thank you for everything you've shared so far. But my question is, uh, feedback generally isn't perceived as praise. It can be perceived as, as advice or criticism. At its best, is it observational? Yeah, it can be. Uh, it, it really depends on the, on the different type of context uh, that I talked through where you get that feedback, out of which mechanism, is there an established process for it, or is it just a, a conversation next to the coffee machine uh, in the office uh, or at the school canteen? I think the, the, the setting in which it happens and the context in which happens defines a lot because um, you know, if, there is, if there is no protocol, and if there is no trust, then you can easily uh, end up, yeah, taking it as criticism, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing because it could be constructive criticism, right? So it really depends on the on those settings, how the feedback happens, uh, and the relationship between those people. The, the most difficult ones again are where there is no protocol and no trust. You end up in emotional conversations, and it's really easy to get sidetracked and pulled into into some traps. Uh, and at that moment, you need the self-awareness to manage the line. Oh, am I getting some thoughts from a book bag here and that I have to consider or not and have those questions and just manage it properly. Um, I, I don't mean to, you know, diminish the value of feedback when I, you know, make this couple of funny comments about uh, the type of people that give feedback. Generally speaking, uh, it really depends on how you take it and the choices you make uh, with, the, with the feedback. And, um, and I think the, the most important reaction is the choice you make, how you take it along, even if you think that this is something I, I, don't need, I don't need to consider, but is there any, any, any other truth in this that I can take along? Um, I think it's a gift. So, um, but you make the choice whether, you know, it's, it's, it's just, negative criticism, is it constructive criticism, is, is it positive feedback, negative feedback, um, and, and how does it help you to achieve a certain goal which may or may not exist at that moment. So I think a couple of input factors are really important to define how that conversation happens. I think Leila has a follow-up question on that. Hi, I'm Leila. Um, what tools do you use when you're receiving what you may feel is hard criticism? Yeah, that's a good question. So the tools I use is, uh, uh, first of all, I think about the setting in which I am, as I was just saying, it, uh, am I getting this feedback within a certain protocol in a, in a high trust environment, or is this just an emotional conversation? 
And in that moment, my tool is to keep my cool, uh, which is not always very easy for me. <laughs> you know, at my age, you get really outspoken and you don't have to hide many things anymore. Uh, and that's okay. You have that luxury. Um, and, um, and keeping your cool and asking a few questions to yourself is, is, is a good tool. But if it happens in a, uh, in, a, in a structured environment, then you think about, okay, this is the context in which I receive this feedback. This is possibly what's expected of me. Hey, I don't really like it. It makes me feel bad. I clearly felt short here. Um, geez, I hate it, but I have to do better. You know, those type of thought processes could be really useful, but it's easier said than done because um, being defensive is the easiest reaction we can show at any given time. So uh, keeping your thoughts in control and thinking about in which context this feedback arrives to you and keep calm and assess it factually versus emotionally are probably the best traits you can have when you receive feedback. You don't have to go nuts right away. And even if it's positive feedback, really positive feedback, the best thing you can say is thank you because it doesn't have to be negative feedback all, all the time, right? Um, but um, you have to establish your ground. That's what I'm trying to say. And there's an interesting one from Shisuan. Shisuan, go ahead. Hi, I'm Zhishen. Um, thank you for sharing. And my question is, as a volunteer firefighter, have you ever received any feedback that you think is meaningful for other aspects of your life? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually something that connects to what we just discussed. The other day I was driving the truck and uh, look, I'm driving vehicles since probably 30, 35 years. I started driving vehicles really early. I can fly airplanes, I can drive tanks, trucks, cars, motorcycles, whatever you can imagine. And obviously that gives me a certain level of comfort. Uh, and for some people, that's a safety issue. So at the fire service, we have this protocol of keeping your both of your hands at the steering wheel at all times. Now I drive one-handed lots of, you know, <laughs> under many occasions because it's okay for me. I know I'm in control and, and I know I, I don't create a safety issue for the crew and and I hate black flies. We have lots of black flies in Australia. They they are just around you all the time. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the joke, you know, when somebody makes this all the time. We call it the Aussie salute because there is so many flies all around you all the time. So sometimes I chase flies when I drive the car, uh, the truck. I just slap my head to to the window or something like that. So the this, the the senior deputy captain came to me after we came from that uh, response. He said. I know what, hey, can you be a bit more focused when you drive the truck next time and keep your hands on the steering wheel and maybe not chase flies? I said, yep, I will do. Now I could have said, oh, come on, you know, flies are so bothering or I don't know, like I'm really good at driving or all. That would have been completely defensive. But I knew that I was receiving this feedback within a certain protocol and within a trust environment and you know, whether it was fully justified or not, it doesn't really matter, but it is. it was just an outcome of something we were supposed to do. So I took that feedback on. And in terms of real life application, yeah, I, I kept my cool. I had a, I rationalized it. And I know that I can display those behaviors in real life as well. If somebody makes me crazy out there on the street and I have a parking incident and somebody says something, I can choose to ignore because I have that ability. Uh, I think those are probably type of examples. Those are all little things, right? Uh, it's not always about the big things in life because a beautiful picture is usually comprised of little strokes and different colors here and there. And our life is like that. Okay, uh, we have now many questions more about the business. Uh, are you ready for those? Oh, absolutely, anything. Just okay, so the, true. All righty, so the first one uh, is on behalf of students and then the others will ask themselves. The question is, in some European countries, by law, boards have employee representatives. Is that good? 
That is, that is a really thoughtful question. Uh, the answer is in short, yes, I love it. I personally love it because um, having employee representatives on boards, which is a level like at the top of the house, where unless you make the effort at those leadership levels in the organizations and especially in bigger organizations, it's really hard to know what really happens in the business because you are continuously exposed to some storytelling from next level or at best next, next level. You don't really know what goes on down here. Having employee representatives in boards, I think is, is, a, is a tremendous luxury for leadership teams to get the 360 view that I talked about and getting the insights uh, from the wider structure in terms of what happens in the business. Now, mind you, it has to be managed because you know at boards you have lots of political issues. There are certain positions you have to take and enforce certain policies and so on. But in its pure form, having employees, the, the employees having a voice at the board level, I think it's a tremendous luxury for the leadership team. And I think they should do everything possible to make the most out of it. They're like those sensors, you know, attached to different parts of our bodies that relay the information. Uh, I, I personally love it. If I ever have the chance to make a decision on that, that would be always my preference to have employee representatives. Um, look, uh, some people, they watch TV and they don't see that at the board, they drink water from TV and, and some Facebook people are asking like for, if that is for water, then for coffee, do you guys get like the coffee from heaven? Or, you know, we get all, all sorts of funny questions. Not one of our students is going to ask a question in a more professional way. So Xiaoning, go ahead. Hi, this is Xiaoning. First of all, thank you for your sharing. My question is, as a president or board member, what issues do you usually need to deal with or what decision you need to make? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I like the way George has formulated it. Yes, uh, you know, we have uh, holy water in boardrooms and special coffee, people that are moving the, the big leaves and keeping us cool all the time and giving us foot massage. Obviously that doesn't happen. Uh, maybe it happens in some boards, I don't really know. But uh, where I had the experience is, um, ideally, uh, you, you know, you, you have certain distinctions in terms of what happens at certain levels in organizations. And imagine it like almost a house or like a, like a pyramid where at the top of the house, you have, um, you have architects that define the strategy and the direction and the reward systems and the targets for the company. And in the middle, you have all those that make it happen. They, let's call it the middle management who, who get this stuff translated into day by day action. And then at the very bottom, you have the doors at, at whatever level, because they are given certain processes, tasks, or certain activities on a day in day out basis. That's in most simple terms, how a corporate structure looks like. So I think at, at board level or at the top leadership team level, uh, sometimes it's easy to get pulled into executional issues um, because somebody comes up with a story, say something to somebody, it eventually ends up on your desk or somebody tells you during a break. That's not the job of a board member. Uh, you know, you, you have to set the, 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 the direction of the entire business, you have, you have to make sure there is a strategy and an operating model for it. And there are the mechanisms in place in which people can perform at their best. They are rewarded in line with their performance and work is flowing through the structure. Uh, that's at very basic level, the, the, the role at the, at the top of the house. Um, but I have seen no positive examples. I have seen shareholders of the business, even this is in public companies, coming into board meetings and asking you, hey, where did you buy this pencil from? Because I know a shop where they sell these are really good on promotional prices. Jeez, what do I care about the pencil price at board level? You know what, there are people do doing that job. Maybe they, do, they don't do it right, but that's a different question. But Everybody has their roles. And at, at board level, that's really the architectural role uh, in terms of the strategic guidance of the company and giving the resources uh, to, 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 
to deliver the expected business results, uh, you know, resource allocation, resource prioritization, strategy, the culture of the business, because that is set from the top of the house. It's not bottom up, it comes top down. Uh, those are the, the type of things that, that board members need to worry about in their, in their roles and not get sidetracked by, by executional discussions about the Pantone -pan colors of certain advertising materials or how the pencil look like uh, and, and things like that. Does that make sense? The next question is from Han Tao. Hi, uh, thank you for sharing. My question is, as board member and president of multiple companies, what is the main difference when working in the US or Germany? Yeah, those are typical cultural differences. Um, um, but here is what I think, as a default setting, I always think, and George will remember this because that was one of our continuous talking points when we visited different, different markets. I believe there are more commonalities among us than differences. Right? Because if you go to a different market, you make a market visit, people usually tell you, oh, you know what, Argentina is different because you know we eat alpacores and we have lots of meat. And blah, blah, blah. So they have their reasons why they are different, right? They tell you all these stories. But actually the truth is there's so much commonalities and depending on the industry and so on, of course there, are, there is variations, but we are all human beings. Uh, there is commonalities. It's important to know that base. But then there are, there are certain cultural differences and there's differences in shopping patterns and, and, and certain areas that you have to be uh, mindful of. Um, but typically those gaps are not too big. Uh, as, a, as, as a first reaction, I can say there are clearly cultural differences between, which markets did you ask? US and what was it? Um, Germany, you said? Germany. Yeah, so it's called U US and Europe, especially Germany, which is the northern part of Europe. The, the culture is as such where people are really direct and straightforward. Uh, they don't beat around the bush. Uh, they will come and say, George, I think you're an ugly person. You cannot say that in the US. <laughs> it's not politically correct just to start with. <laughs> You know, uh, but you may hear something like that in the Northern European cultures because that's okay with them. They, they are very direct and, and very open, which actually I find personally that makes things really easy because you don't have to second guess of the meaning of certain statements of, of uh, what somebody said and so on. Uh, it's always, the fish is always on the table. In US, my experience, that's not always the case. Sometimes you have to think about so the person said this, um, what did that person actually mean? And, and that's, you know, that's just a waste of time and energy, uh, quite honestly, but that's me, right? So I'm not saying there's right and wrong on these things. I'm just telling my personal experience. Um, I also find that generally in the US business, there is an underlying anxiety in the business cultures uh, and it's a passive aggressive culture. Uh, people are nice on the surface but highly aggressive on the background. Um, and that plays through um, uh, as well. Um, in Europe, you don't necessarily see that. And then Southern part of Europe, people are a bit like the Latinos. You have the Mediterranean culture, there is high energy. There's lots of smiles, lots of body movements, lots of gestures as I'm doing sometimes on this call. So, um, and those are the differences as well. It's, it's important to know these things because sometimes Within the con bringing this within to the context of feedback and communication, you have to convey messages in a tactful way sometimes. Uh, in Asia, for example, let's take Japan or, or China, uh, there is certain courtesy norms that you have to respect when you, when you relay a message. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that because a company is European or American, whatever, that there are some standard uh, norms that apply, they may or they may not, but it doesn't mean that you have to disregard the cultural differences in those places. Um, and, and I think sometimes they, they make or break uh, a certain situation, uh, even if the message in itself is, is the right one, if it's outside the cultural norms, it usually doesn't end up properly uh, at the destination. Will it be okay if we go over for a few minutes? We have 
three more questions. That... George, I am at your complete disposal. <laughs> so thanks very much. So uh, about Asia, this question is from Jenny Goldman. <coughs> he says, what makes the Asia Pacific markets unique? Does Asia Pacific have a most growth potential? And if so, why? Yeah, so I, I don't know where, you know, the hypothesis or hypothesis of Asia Pacific being unique comes off. Uh, uh, every market and every geography is a bit unique <laughs> in its way. Um, I can just repeat what I said a few minutes ago in terms of actually there are commonalities uh, across the globe. But yes, there are lots of differences uh, as well, because every region has their own particularities in terms of what industries are more of what are more accentuated. Uh, for example, in Australia, mining is, is a big thing. There is uh, you know, iron and uh, you know, gold and any sort of other metals you can, you can think of that Australians are digging out and, and exporting to the rest of the world. Um, in some other part of, in another geography, services might be more important uh, for, for a given economy. But after all, it really comes down to the um, uh, to the general economic setting and, and the political environment in which certain markets uh, are applying their own fiscal policies, how they stimulate and incentivate private businesses to flourish, um, how they drive consumption and GDP. Those are the things, and and you will remember again, George, and and I'm uh, I'm sure. Um, you know, those days where we try to prioritize certain markets in terms of their potential. And because you have sort of 100 plus markets in front of you, you cannot do everything at once. So you have to prioritize in a certain way, uh, which then means that you have to apply certain criteria saying, oh, based on this criteria, which is important to our business, what markets stand out? And that could be Asia Pacific uh, because it might be the highest growth potential. Uh, and actually over the last, uh, probably about five, six years, Asia Pacific stood out in terms of its growth potential vis-a-vis -vis other markets. If you go back 10 years ago, we had something called BRIC, which was Brazil, Russia, India, and China. That was the thing. You had to be in the BRIC markets because that was the highest potential. But then things change. It's always an evolution. Uh, and in the last five years, it's been more about Southeast Asia. China is always there. China is always the elephant in the room, right? So China never loses its importance. Let's just park that fact. But Southeast Asia, markets like Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, uh, because of their um, uh, the increase in disposable income, better distribution of wealth, uh, highly dynamic economies, and whether by coincidence or not, certain policies that have facilitated that positive dynamic those markets have stood out as a potential for, for many industries. The next question is from Lou. Um, thank you, Professor. Um, so um, my question is, uh, who is more important to a company, its customer or its employees? If you had to take a guess, what would be your best guess, Lou? Uh, I will say customers. And what makes you say that? Because uh, I feel like company needs to make money, right? To survive. So customer is the one who paying the, the money. So that's what I feel like. Customers is the, the key. But like for a company, like the bigger company, the employees is also important because they are the one who run the company. So that's why I asked yeah. the question. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I respect your point of view. My, my perspective is a bit different. I think people are more important if I had to make a choice between the two. Um, because before you get to the level of addressing your customers, you need to have the right people in place. And to, you need to have a, the right business value proposition in place. Uh, I.e., what does the business do? How does it generate value? Um, and 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 what makes that happen are the people that the business employs who then deals with these customers. Uh, you may have a great set of customers out there for any given business. If you don't have the right people to manage those customers, 
it will just collapse. Um, that's how I look at it. Um, I always think you. about the people as the soul of any company. That is really the soul. There is, there is a skeleton, there is a structure, there is firm things uh, that, you know, more tangible aspects of a business, but the most intangible asset uh, and the most valuable from my standpoint are the people and its culture. The last question is from Michelle. Hi, how are you? I'm Michelle. Um, my question is, if you could give your younger self your best piece of advice before entering the workforce, what would it be? Yeah, I would probably keep giving myself the same advice as, as I keep doing today after uh, such a long time. Uh, as I said earlier, I, I didn't have the luxury of certain people telling me, hey, do this. This is a really good advice. Keep that in mind. I had to learn by myself. And and in certain cases, by making lots of mistakes, which was great, uh, because as I said earlier, again, failure is a shortcut to success. You make a mistake, and if you have the, the mindset to learn from your mistakes, sometimes really painful, I must say, uh, you learn really, really quickly. So the two things I personally favor is be yourself. Uh, I think that never changes um, because um, due to a variety of reasons, I see people who try to put on different faces than, than who they are, thinking that it might serve the target audience, whatever that target audience is. The company you interview for a job, uh, your girlfriend, boyfriend, or your teammates, whatever that target audience is. But the truth is, uh, you know, it, we just make a difference by being ourselves, whatever that is. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But eventually you will find a place where you, as you, as person, will be in the right setting. And I think that's when you know, many things come together uh, for a meaningful life and fulfilling life. The other thing is like, never forget where you come from and your roots. Uh, I come from a very modest family. I had you no know, uh, advantages in terms of having a kickstart versus others in what I did. Um, it, if not for everything, for most of the things I can think of, I did it myself. Uh, it's true that I have been given chances saying, hey, there is a business opportunity here or a market where you could go and do X, Y, Z role. Would you be willing to? But the decision was mine. Um, you know, whether it was an attractive place or a really shitty place, whether you make that decision uh, by these opportunities, but you don't forget where you come from. And, and your roots. Uh, I started as a salesman in S.C. Johnson back in 93. You know, I had a bag in my hand. I was calling on customers and, uh, and, and did it day in, day out. And, and eventually I made it up the food chain to certain roles, which I'm grateful for. But you get sometimes privileges along life that make it really easy to take things for granted. I think that's a big trap as well. I think keeping a humble perspective and remembering your roots and being yourself are probably the best advices I would give to myself. That's a great answer. So um, thanks. I would like to thank also um, Natalie and Ria who have been helping out uh, today. Natalie is our host and Ria uh, with all the Q and A's coming. And our students have prepared a very short video to thank you. See, I don't know, Ria, if you want to, there we go. Thank you for your advice on effective feedback and its impact on future success. I want to thank you for sharing such an amazing presentation with us and your valued feedback in business world. Thank you very much, Mr. Subasi, for sharing such wonderful insights in the business field. Thank you for bringing your personal experiences to us. Gracias. Thank you, Mr. Subasi, for your presentation. I learned a lot from your lesson, and I think I will absorb and I try to practice the knowledge that I learned from today in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time and showing us how important feedback can be in the personal and professional world.
Yeah, so Ubit, on behalf of all the students and all the people who have joined online to, for different countries and continents, thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. And uh, we learn a lot and I'm sure we will have an opportunity to, to invite you back. Absolute pleasure. I must say, after seeing the video, which is really cute, you guys made a real big bet on me saying, you know, without knowing what's coming up, you made a pre-recording saying, hey, thanks for this, without knowing what's coming up. So I appreciate the trust. Uh, and I hope, you know, you enjoyed it. I certainly did. Uh, these are the type of things you can talk about hours and hours. Uh, it was a great opportunity, George, uh, and, and the privilege. Thank you again for giving me this chance and, and sharing this time all together. Thanks. All righty. Thank you. Take care. Bye all bye. the best, Thanks everyone. All Thank the best of all. luck. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.